Dr. Binu is the head of the Department of uh, Nephrology, Lutz Hospital. He has his basic degree from Toronto Medical College and MD from MMC Madras and DM from Toronto Medical College. You all must be knowing about the book Alagappa. Alagappa was his, his professor and uh, Dr. Binu has contributed some chapters in the Alagappa, uh, book of medicine Alagappa. Over to you. Thank you, sir. It is, an indeed, uh, it is indeed an honor to be here. I am a regular viewer of all the WhatsApp messages that you send and have, uh, almost always I go through the messages and I'm so happy to be a part of it. I must especially thank uh, the API for two things. One, for selecting this particular topic, which is not there in most of the books. You have to search a lot of books to find out uh, these topics. And uh, more interestingly, uh, it is not an, in an organized form. You have to actually organize it. So I'm uh, thankful to the scientific committee for selecting this topic. Second is uh, I'm on, extremely honored to be a part of this uh, positions which is which is one of our which is one of the topic which is close to my heart but then i have to leave uh, general medicine for just because i couldn't fathom the vastness of this science so it's indeed an honor to be a part of api uh, as always we have tried to be a part of api i, I think all the nephrologists would also share the same thing uh, for the last one and a half years we have been busy with our association with that that happens to be on a friday so most often I would not be able to come, but then I hope to come again and again. Thank you for the invite. And let me go to this topic, proteinuria and acetemia in an asymptomatic patient. So very often we are confronted with a patient who has got a report which says that there is significant proteinuria which has been diagnosed, which has been found on, on, a, on an executive checkup or a checkup to go abroad. So that is how these patients land to us. Now, before going on to the topic proper, I would like to highlight that uh, of late, we have been relying more on spot urine estimations or protein creatinine ratio and uh, albumin creatinine ratio. The idea of protein creatinine ratio is to simplify so as to estimate, um, so as to avoid the cumbersome collection of a 24-hour urine to, to estimate the proteinuria. So the premise is that any individual would excrete 1000 milligram or 1 gram of protein of, of creatinine per day. So just to say that if you estimate the amount of proteinuria for 1 gram of creatinine, that would mean the 24 hour collection. So the same is applicable to proteinuria as well as albuminuria. So if you can do a protein creatinine ratio, that would imply the 24 hour urine estimation. Likewise with albumin also, if, in, if you can measure the albumin creatinine ratio, then it, it estimates the 24 hour urine albumin excretion. So it's a spot collection. There can be a lot of, lot of fallacies in it. Uh, the premise is that the renal function should be normal so that one gram of creatinine is excreted in urine. And uh, the morning sample is, uh, is most useful because the proteinuria varies as, you, as the day goes by. And uh, we, we still rely on the 24-hour urine estimation because most of the tests are, uh, there are a lot of fallacies in it. Now, uh, the, the, imp the difference between proteinuria and albuminuria I'll dwell upon later, but then proteinuria would mean not just albumin, there is globulin, there is Tom Haskell protein and so many other proteins which are usually uh, detected. Now, asymptomatic proteinuria would mean different things. Normal proteinuria is around 300 milligram per day and that would include TAM phosphor proteins, albumin and all the proteins that are commonly seen. So up to 300 is considered as insignificant. 300 to 1000 would mean a tubular proteinuria and more than 1000 would mean a glomerular proteinuria. Nephrotic range is more than 3500. So the idea is to find out if there is, is, if there is a glomerular disease. So if you have a glomerular disease, you probably have a systemic disease in which the immunoglobulins or the circulating factors are being deposited. So the idea is to differentiate between glomerular and a non-glomerular proteinuria. That is how we differentiate a, a grave illness. So that is the premise. And second is a proteinuria. Somebody who has got a proteinuria between 300 to 1000. The approach would be 
to follow them up because these patients can go to a stage where the proteinuria would become significant. So if there is an, if a fall in GFR patient has got a mild or a borderline elevation in creatinine, we would consider a biopsy because these are the three things which, uh, which, could, un which could be underlying. One is a focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, IG nephropathy, which is very, very common. Uh, it's a grave disease, very often diagnosed in a young, in a young or a middle-aged individual. So uh, it's one thing which is often missed out also, even by nephrologist. And third possibility is a second region where the gene occurs as a part of the, sec of the systemic disease. Now, normal renal function with no decline in GFR, we would, we would actually go for a follow-up. We keep them on follow-up. And if the proteinuria goes above 1,000, we tend to do a biopsy. And uh, in a patient whose proteinuria is between 300 to 1,000, uh, any pathology would doesn't mean anything except for follow-up. And proteinuria between 1,000 to 3,500. Uh, in a person who it is being, it is persisting, a young person who is pers whom it is persisting, then we would consider a kidney biopsy. Of course, if there is a renal dysfunction, we should consider a biopsy very early on. And one other situation where we consider a biopsy is when we have an extra renal symptoms. Most often it is an autoimmune disorder or an any other coagulation disorder, uh, uh, collagen vascular disorders. Now, now, nephrotic range proteinuria, very often it is symptomatic, but then there can be asymptomatic as well. In, in such situations, we would uh, give a steroid trial if it is a if a young patient younger than 17 years we would ask for a steroid trial but then if it is a normal renal function renal function is normal as of now there is a new recommendation which has come we can measure the anti phospholipase a2 receptor antibody if that is found to be positive then you can very well presume it is a the diagnosis is membranous glomerulonephritis and we can start treating so Biopsy is not indicated in such a situation. That is the new recommendation. And uh, kidney biopsy, if the, if the patient is thyroid unresponsive, there is renal down, uh, dysfunction, and if there is extra renal involvement. So when we were students, we were told that the functional unit of the kidney is actually the nephron. But as we progressed in nephrology, of late, we are made to believe that it is the podocyte which is the, which is the functional unit of the kidney. So a podocyte, as you can see here, it goes around the capillaries and it covers roughly 70% of the capillaries surface area. So it's not just a, a structural uh, a structural tissue, but it has a lot of function, including the function, including the function of the filtration barrier. So with that, let me go to diabetic nephropathy. Again, very important we, we very often we have a patient who is so worried who has come out uh, come up with the diagnosis of a microalbuminuria. As I said, normally microalbuminuria is less than 30. Anything between 30 to 300 is microalbuminuria. And clinical albuminuria or over diabetic nephropathy is diagnosed when the albuminuria exceeds 300 milligram. So uh, this is just to show the filtration barrier. And uh, uh, the filtration barrier would mean that. It is only a, an, a, a, a charge defect which occurs in albinuria and a structural defect occurs in, uh, in proteinuria. So what, does, what is our understanding of microalbinuria? Over a period of 10 years follow-up, 40% of uh, micro diabetics with microalbinuria would progress on to develop proteinuria. 40% would remain the same. 20% would regress over a 10-year period. So, Overall risk of diabetic nephropathy in, in a diabetic is 40%. So microalmuria doesn't mean t doesn't uh, have any significance in terms of progression to overt nephropathy. So it has got significance only in the setting when there is an underlying other microvascular disease like a retinopathy or a peripheral neuropathy. So that is what. So a lot of questions have been asked. One of the review articles have discussed whether it is a time to abandon microalbuminuria. So with that in mind, uh, let us uh, critically evaluate the situation, which is more of a significance, proteinuria or albinuria. Albinuria, as I said, is a charge defect of the base membrane, and proteinuria indicates a structural uh, disease of the glomerular base membrane. 
So albinuria is a disease, as I said, of the diffuse endothelial system. So of late, we have been learning more about the endothelium. And we are sure enough the statement is, tr is true. Only, one is only as old as one's endothelium. So that is what albinuria, a microalbinuria or an albinuria would indicate. That is a disease of the endothelium. Uh, this is how this is the endothelial cell, which has got it's a very complex cell, not just a barrier. It has got endocrine function, it has got secretory function, it has got a lot of membrane proteins which have uh, which are made, uh, helpful in hemostasis and so on. So albinuria would mean an endothelial dysfunction. ED could mean anything. Endothelial ED could mean endothelial as well as anything, and uh, it implies cardiovascular disease. In a patient with sepsis or a snake bite, it would mean diffuse capillary leak, and it would predict adverse outcome in almost all diseases. So be that as it may. Next is going to acetemia. Acetemia, as the term implies, is it just means that the nitrogen in the blood has increased. So uh, what would that mean? Uh, that would mean that uh, more urea is being reabsorbed or there is a decrease in circulation through the kidney. So commonly occurs in three situations. One, when there is decrease in blood flow to the kidneys, as in salt and water depletion in patients with congestive cardiac failure, in uh, HRS, that is a uh, hepatorenal syndrome, then overseas diuretic use and fluid depletion. Hypercatabolism is another situation which we all often see in the ICU or in a patient who is admitted with, uh, with sepsis. Fever, steroids, tetracycline, all these can induce hypercatabolism. In this one would mean that uh, gluconeogenesis occurs where protein is broken down and converted to glucose and the byproduct comes in. So that is how hypercatabolism is defined. And then we have excess protein absorption as in a UGA bleed or a hyperalimentation. Now, uh, acetemia is not often a bad sign. It indicates good sign as well. For example, in a patient who is in the ICU, who's been, uh, whose protein intake is adequate, we can assume that the protein intake is adequate in such patient. And uh, second, it would mean that the synthetic function of the liver, where the liver is properly synthesizing ure urea and other bi uremic byproducts. And it would also mean that the system is combating the sepsis which the patient has. Acetemia is sinister when the patient has got overt sepsis, proteinuria, or in the setting of cardiac failure. Now, approach would be to collect the, uh, correct the fluid deficit which occurs. Sorry, it is a, uh, correct the fluid deficit and uh, reduce the dose of steroid, treat the infection, and remove excess of protein from the gut. And another thing would be to reduce protein hyperalimentation if it is done. So that is with regard to the topic proper. Just a thought on calcium channel blockers, which is why we are here. Uh, sympathetic overactivity is often underestimated in a hypertensive and we should have antiepidensis which control the sympathetic activity and of late we have been having uh, L and L channels so what we have been using are the L type of uh, calcium channel receptors N type is available it inhibits uh, cyst the, the sympathetic system so it affects both the efferent and ar efferent arterial so the intraglomerular pressure is reduced and it reduces proteinuria so there are trials which have compared amylodipine and sildenafil, and proteinuria has been found to be better with sildenafil. And uh, as for us, sildenafil seems to be a better alternative to ARBs because of the fear of use, uh, renal failure with ARBs. We uh, most of us have switched to sildenafil because we get to see more of vascular disease in our patients. So sildenafil is a good alternative to the time-tested and the data-tested drug that is uh, angiotensin receptor analogs. Thank you. Thank you for the patient here. Thank you, Dr. Binu, for making this very subject very simple for the practicing physicians. The subject is open for discussion. Uh, as, the do as we escalate the dose, uh, we tend to, the patient tends to have edema just like amylodipine. So generally, we use 20 milligram to 30 milligram. We use uh, 20 to 30 in our dialysis patients because they have... Uh, renal parenchymal hypertension, which is refractory. So we tend to use 30 milligram of uh, sildenafil. But the problem is, as you escalate the dose, you tend to have edema as with any other calcium channel blockers.
the time tested and all the data is with ARBs. There is no doubt about it. We have had uh, studies with with patients with renal failure, with cardiac failure. So on all patients, on all accounts, ARBs and ACI are better. But then for safety purpose, even with, at any level of creatine, there is a mild increase in creatine. If the, if the drug is effective, if ARBs are effective, they say that uh, the creatine should increase a little bit. Uh, beyond 30% is not acceptable, but then up to 30% elevation in creatinine is expected. So for fear of uh, such an event, we have, uh, most of our patients are on silidipine. Uh, that is... Uh, One small question. The basic concept uh, we learned from physiology, that in all type 2 diabetes, there is microangiopathy and macroangiopathy. And very often before the onset of diabetes, Microangiopathy precedes diabetes, and we are also taught that uh, it is always retinorenal. If there is retinal involvement, there is always renal involvement. Now, many a time we see patients without retinal involvement coming with only renal involvement. What is your experience regarding that? Next question is uh, exactly as what uh, the previous uh, speaker mentioned. What exactly is the role of silinidipine in a patient with renal failure? up to what level? You explained, uh, but can you clarify on that and what is the dose that is recommended? Second thing is, uh, is there edema, pedal edema associated with silinidipine? As a family trait, there should be pedal edema. Now, when, uh, after a couple of years of usage, I see some patients presenting with pedal edema. Anyway, you presented it extremely well to an audience like this. We, learned, we had a lot of good points takeaway messages and I must concede that is one person I always consult at our hospital when in doubt. He is our super consultant. And I Not always really. feel that nephrologist is one person who is uh, a level above general physician because they generally deal with all aspects of medicine. Thank you, Bino, and congratulations to you. Thank you. Three things. One is, one is, as you said, Around 10% of patients will have no retinopathy. Even if they have diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, there is no retinopathy. Despite screening, we, have, we go to the extent of doing OCT and so on. And then, even then, we don't get retinopathy. We have instances where we had a biopsy done in such patients and got diabetic nephropathy. So, the point is, in type 2 diabetes, they often present with the complication. Unlike in type 1 where polys, uh, polygoria, polydipsy and uh, polyphagia are the findings. In type 2, most often they present with the complication. And uh, needless to say, we have seen patients who had diabetic nephropathy at the time of diagnosis of uh, diabetes mellitus. So, it does occur when with in isolation without uh, an ophthalmologic involvement. But generally, the saying is 90% concurrence. And second is with regard to the use of sildipine. Uh, very often, we have a patient who just disappears after one consultation. And uh, we had instances where we started ACE inhibitors and when the patient came back after two years, they had florid renal failure and so on. So, uh, to avoid that, we usually put them on, on sildipine. Of course, if the proteinuria is, is very significant, we have no choice. We have to start them on ACE inhibitors. But the point is, we should make sure that the patient comes back for follow-up. Because unlike what is written in the West, we get to see more of vascular disease. So most often these patients have some renovascular disease and they have significant elevation of, I mean, drop in GFR after starting ACE or ARBs. So that is one concern with ACE ARBs. Third thing is about the edema. As I said, if you keep on escalating the dose, you tend to have edema. So mild, mild doses as, as with 5 mg of pamelodipine, we can surely, con you surely convert it to 10 mg of pamelodipine and maintain them. But for escalating doses, these patients tend to have edema. Uh, is there any role of SGLT2 inhibitors as alternative to ACE inhibitors? Yes, yes. SGLT2, again, we have almost similar kind of evidence with the SGLT2 inhibitors. But then the occurrence of renal failure, acute kidney injury, and mild reduction in GFR is, is again a scare in such patients. So SGLT2 inhibitors have been found to be effective, but then they are also been found to be uh, found to cause acute kidney injury in such patients. Because 
uh, intense diuresis that produces produces a, a drop in GFR to start with. So a drop in GFR is expected even with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Do you have any preference on one AC inhibitor or the other in terms of renal failure when you exhibit if you, this? If line? you look at it, if, the, if you look at the physiology behind it, almost if the more potent the AC inhibitor, the more prevalence of cough. That is how it is. Because the bradycanon levels will go high when you when you tend to increase the AC AC enzyme so uh, we have uh, we have lowered the use of ace inhibitors as such ramipril of course continues to be used because of its if uh, its data the large trial is with ramipril we tend to use ramipril if the patient can tolerate there are patients who have been on ramipril for maybe decades who come for follow up for them we continue but then lisinopril dysthesia and uh, cough is a real problem whether we should send urine uh, protein creatinine ratio or urine albumin ratio, which is the better one? Uh, very important question. Uh, as I said, uh, when you have a patient with renal failure, uh, doing an ACR uh, albumin creatinine ratio or a protein urea, protein creatinine ratio may not be effective. We have to ask for a 24 urine estimation itself. The idea is, if you have a high protein urea, they tend to progress faster. Even in diabetic nephropathies, if you have more significant proteinuria, they tend to progress faster than those without proteinuria. So that is basically the, uh, the reason why we look at proteinuria in such patients. Pinaron has come into market, uh, but we are uh, scared to use it for two reasons. One, it produces, it can produce hyperkalemia. And second, the cost uh, is roughly 100 rupees per day. Phenerodon has come into market. It is basically a, 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 a congener of uh, spinal lactone. A lot of evidence is there to, as, as, so as to preventing renal fibrosis as well as cardiac fibrosis. But then we are scared to use for these two reasons. The scare of hyperkalemia still exists and the scare of uh, the cost is also high. And there are uh, studies which have shown that you can use potassium channel blockers to combine uh, to, to promote the use of this particular drug so as of now we have not uh, dwelled into that area it's available in the market it's costly as of now we have nothing to uh, actually reduce the progression of diabetic nephropathy it is the natural progression which occurs despite having a lot of molecules fancy molecules are available in the in the market but none of them have uh, proved the test of time there are no other questions. We will wind up this session. Thank you, Dr. Bino. Thank you.